Hello? And then turn it off.
Welcome to the second talk of the seminar School of Engineering. This series aims to bring together students and researchers from New York, New Jersey, and neighboring regions to discuss the most the most um, important recent trends around the entire globe. In Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, India, and even Ukraine, and other European locals. The speakers are all renowned experts whose research is making an immense impact on the development of new machine learning te and technologies, helping to build a better, smarter, more electrical and computer engineering for hosting this series. I extend special thanks to Professor Shivendra Panvar for offering invaluable help to me, Chair Ivan Selesnik for his support, and Raquel Thompson for being my very capable right-hand person and for the tremendous work she has done. The overall mission of NYU Tandon is to promote technologies that can be used for the benefit of society. And I'm happy to have the school's wholehearted support for this seminar, which explores the many ways in which AI is benefiting the world. Without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed speaker and tell you a little bit about him. Joshua Benjo earned his PhD in computer science from McGill University in 1991. He did postdocs at MIT and Bell Labs, and since 1993, he has been a computer science professor at the University of Montreal. He has authored three books and over 300 publications, mostly in deep learning, which have been cited more than 100,000 times. Joshua holds the title of Canada Research Chair in Statistical Learning Algorithms, is an officer of the Order of Canada, and was awarded the Marie Victor in Quebec Prize in 2017. He is also a C4 Senior Fellow and co directs its Learning and Machines and Brains program. Additionally, he is a Scientific Director of the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms, MILA, currently the largest academic research group on deep learning. He's on the NIPS Foundation Board, previously serving as a program chair and general chair, and he co-created the iClear conference, which focused on deep learning. In fact, he pioneered the field of deep learning, and his goal has been to uncover the <laughs> principles giving rise to intelligence through learning, as well as to contribute to the development of AI for the benefit of all. Joshua will speak about generative adversarial networks and unsupervised representation learning. Please join me in welcoming him now. Hello, thank you for, do you hear me? Yes? Okay. Ah, Better. now I realize it works. So, for those who are interested, I also co-authored a book called Deep Learning, which is meant to help people get into this field. And uh, there are uh, chapters of the book are free online, so uh, feel free to browse them. I want to thank a number of collaborators. Uh, in particular, a lot of the work I'll be talking about is from my postdoc, Devin Hale, but also a lot of uh, other uh, students and, and faculty with whom I've been working. So, as you know, a large proportion of uh, current implementations of machine learning in industry and deep learning are based on supervised learning. Um, however, I and others have been saying for a number of years that supervised learning has its limitations. Um, and as an example, uh, there's the uh, issue of adversarial examples, so uh, a classifier which uh, sees this as a dog, can be tricked into seeing a slightly modified image as an ostrich uh, when you, you choose the changes in pixel properly. But more generally, if you look at the kind of errors that these systems make, they clearly have a very superficial understanding of the world, uh, of the kind of uh, environment, it, it, like the kind of data that they're trained on. And so uh, they, they, you, know, you have to remember that what we're trying to do what we have been trying to do for more than a decade now with deep learning is, is provide learning machines with uh, more abstract representations. This has been the program all along, and we are still far from you know, uh, reaching success. We've, been pretty, we've done pretty amazing progress. And so one idea that uh, uh, Jan and I have been pushing for uh, more than a decade is the idea that we'd like our representations uh, 
our highest level representations in particular to capture and separate or disentangle the underlying abstractions. And so uh, the idea of disentangling is connected to the idea of invariance that has been, of course, at the center of much work in pattern recognition, computer vision for many decades. But whereas the idea of invariance is we're trying to look at for features that are invariant to things we don't care about, in the case of, um, of deep learning, we're trying to be a bit more ambitious and uh, design features that are going to be, uh, some of which are going to be sensitive to uh, some factors, but insensitive to others. And so we can separate all of the underlying factors. And this is especially important when you're doing unsupervised learning or even for transfer learning. You'd like to separate those factors so that whatever subset of factors is relevant for a particular task is used, uh, but, but maybe for another task, it's a different set of factors that is relevant. Uh, another way to think about it is that we're looking for representations that, uh, in which the relationships between variables become simple. So in pixel space, the relationship between pixels is very, very complicated. The data is concentrated near highly nonlinear manifolds. Uh, so a geometric interpretation is we're trying to make these manifolds flat. Another interpretation is we transform the data into a space where the joint distribution becomes simple, like uniform or Gaussian or something like this. So that, so that would also be a way to think about uh, the properties we're looking for. Um, we started actually doing experiments on uh, unsupervised learning uh, properties uh, that give rise to separating the underlying factors uh, about eight years ago or something. Uh, and we found that even without putting anything special in this, these were the days of denoising auto encoders, there would be factors that specialize on some underlying factor and other factor and other uh, neurons uh, dimensions that specialize on other known factors. Um, and I think it remains an open question as to what is a good representation. The things I've told you right now are fairly sort of hand wavy, right, and, and intuitive, but it's not clear how to put that into mathematical uh, terms. And uh, there's been a number of attempts to do that. In general, my view on this, and that was uh, presented in a paper with uh, Aaron Corville and, and Pascal Vincent in 2013, is that in order to help a learner figure out good representations, we have to put in some kind of assumptions about the world. There's, you, know, you know probably about the no free lunch theorem in machine learning that says that there is no completely universal machine learning algorithm that in order to get generalization, you need to put some priors, some assumptions. But the game that I and others are playing is, you know, can we get away with the simplest possible assumptions that would provide good generalization, but at the same time would, uh, would would be very, very compact and simple and, and, and thus work on many, many different types of tasks. And, and we can express a lot of that prior knowledge by speaking about those representations. So for a long time, researchers have been studying representations that incorporate some notion of um, spatial and temporal structure, uh, spatial and, and temporal um, uh, equivariance and, and locality and multiple scales. So that, for example, is something you find a lot in, in convolutional nets, but, but also in other in unsupervised learning objectives that were proposed already in the early 90s. Uh, another example is what's called marginal independence, when we're saying when we map the data to a representation, the, uh, the different variables, the different neurons um, have a, a joint distribution uh, when we, when we uh, marginalize over the input uh, and we just consider their joint, uh, that factorizes and, and is just a product of the, of the individual marginals. So that's called marginal independence. And this is behind most of the deep generative models, including the GANs that I'll be telling you about. Um, I won't have time to talk about these, but some of the current projects that we're working on in my group uh, extend this list with things like uh, the idea that um, the, the, the joint distribution uh, at one time, but also across times, can be expressed with very, very simple statements, similar to rules and facts in classical AI, which involve only a few variables at a time. Uh, this is the idea of the consciousness prior paper. 
And another uh, related thing we're looking at it has to do with relating representations with actions. So there's a lot of interest right now in the machine learning community uh, with learning agents and, and reinforcement learning, um, which I think are um, getting closer to a very important notion for approaching AI, which is how do we capture representations in which the factors are uh, really um, getting at the underlying causes. And, um, and, uh, and, and one way to get about causes is to have an agent that can actually intervene in the world and do things. And so this approach is, is relating the actions and the policies with aspects of the world that can be controlled. So the aspect of control, controllability. But I, want, I won't spend uh, time on this today. Uh, one of the general ideas with uh, many deep generative models, as I mentioned earlier, is that we think of the data in the data space as forming a very complicated distribution that concentrates, uh, say, on the lower, near a lower dimension manifold, and then the encoder maps points in this space to a new space in which the distribution is going to be much simpler, like, like, like say, uh, a flat. Uh, Euclidean space, which may be Gaussian or uniform. And so you, you typically would like to have uh, maps one way and the other way. And, and the maps going the other way can be used to generate. So now we'll typically have two ingredients in our generative model. We'll have uh, the distribution in the latent space, which may be very simple, like a Gaussian. And then we, after we sample a point in that space, we would apply a, a generator or a decoder. Uh, which may be deterministic or may also add some, uh, some noise. And, uh, and pretty much all of the approaches can fit into this picture. Sometimes, though, there is no encoder or sometimes there's no decoder for some of the variants. So uh, why do we even care about generative models? Well, um, there are many good reasons. Uh, what can you do with them? You can generate conditionally. So in other words, given some variables, you want to generate the distribution from the, the conditional distribution of other variables. Like if, if, if somebody tells you, I would like to, uh, if the face of a, of a woman between 30 and 39, then you'd, have, you'd like to have a machine that can generate things like this. Um, uh, if somebody tells you, so here's a little text. This bird has a yellow belly and a tars and tarsus, gray back, wings, and brown throat, blah, blah, blah. Uh, please give me an image uh, that would be corresponding to this. And you should be able to sample many different images that would be fitting this description. So we already have systems that do this. I mean, they're not, uh, they could be better, but it's already amazing what's going on. Uh, you can also do things like style transfer, where you combine different aspects. You can, again, basically condition on, uh, say, a style. You can generate uh, a new image that, that uh, carries the content of one image and the style of another. Um, you can denoise. Um, again, it's a, it's a transformation in which the, the generator has to uh, fill in information that is not present in the input. And so there really is a conditional distribution of outputs given inputs, which is non-trivial. And it wouldn't really work to use a simple Gauss, conditional Gaussian model as we used to do in the past. Um, and similarly, you can do super resolution. So you, again, you're filling in the details. Uh, these days, the, the, these generative models, uh, mostly based on GANs, are doing pretty amazing things, like these images uh, coming from NVIDIA, which are all not real people, but you know, generated synthetically. Okay? So a few years ago, somebody would have told me we can do this with a computer, and none of these correspond to a real person. Uh, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, Coming back to you know, why generative models are interesting, from a more fundamental point of view, uh, they, they discover these latent spaces that I was mentioning. And, and sometimes directions in that space are actually meaningful. In fact, that's the idea of disentangling factors, that if I move in some direction, uh, I can now change the generated image into one that uh, corresponds maybe to changing gender. So you can interpolate between two points in the latent space and you look at the images being generated in between, uh, and, uh, and you see sort of that all of the uh, images make sense. This is non-trivial, right? Because the, the manifold of images is highly curved. And if you were to take, do the same kind of exercise uh, according to some other arbitrary space, it wouldn't work. You would get 
things in between that don't look like natural images. So this is pretty amazing. Um, and so in general, we'd like to have these two directions. Uh, you, we could use these things for semi-supervised learning, where we have some labeled data and some unlabeled data. Once we've mapped the data to that latent space where things are simple, hopefully uh, the, 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 the categories are become, becoming easy to separate, and just one or a few examples of each category may be sufficient to, to discover a good classifier. Okay. Um, now, let me uh, start with the GANs and how I got uh, interested in these types of models. Um, so, before GANs, the approaches that people were using were all maximum likelihood based, or some variations of. And uh, one problem with maximum likelihood models is that they... Um, they would pay a huge price if your model was putting probability mass very close to the data manifold, but not exactly on the data manifold. And so if we're, if we're thinking that the, the, the solution to the problem is, is, a, is a manifold, but that it's not going to be possible to put it exactly on the right place, then, then maximum likelihood is not appropriate. Because you know, uh, if that training point gets a uh, zero probability under my model, then I'm going to pay an infinite price in log likelihood. Um, so what happens is the, the maximum likelihood models would do things like this. They would put density you know, in a sort of much more conservative way, much wider, occupying a much larger volume to make sure that all the training points and test points, because we're doing cross-validation to choose capacity, uh, are covered in the support of the density. This is, of course, a cartoon. It's not the yes, no. But one thing I realized a while ago is that when you're trying to estimate distributions in, in uh, high dimensions, or at least the kinds of distributions we're working with, things like text and images and stuff like sounds, um, it feels like, and I think more math needs to be done around this, um, it's not the numerical value of the density that matters, but the, but the support is the most important thing. Um, that um, really a good approximation of what we're trying to do uh, when we're trying to estimate these high dimensional densities is that we're trying to figure out where the support is. So if we could train a classifier that figures out sort of on one side we have the high density data on the other side, uh, the high density region and the other side it's low density, that would do most of the job. Um, and, and so it turns out that around the same time I was uh, thinking about these questions, uh, Apple Ivarinen and his group was working, were working on uh, similar ideas and he came up with something called noise contrastive estimation, which does exactly that. It's, it's trying to uh, obtain a density uh, by training a classifier which is going to separate between the data and a, a noise model. So this is not exactly like the GANs, but I think this is pretty much uh, the closest ancestor. Um, and so now uh, the GAN game is going to be similar, but instead of discriminating between the... Um, the data and a, and, a, and, a, and a noise model, we're going to discriminate between the data and a generative model. And uh, as the generative model gets closer to the data, the classifier is going to have a hard time more and more to separate the two. Okay, so we have two distributions that we'd like to compare, right? We have the data distribution, the target distribution, um, and, the, and we're going to, well, we have our prior distribution that we're going to throw into a neural net, a generator, and so together, the, 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 the prior and the generator form a, a new distribution. Um, and we're going to call you know, this uh, the, the, uh, the machine that produces fake money. And then we have real money. And we have a discriminator, which we can think of as the police, which is trying to figure out whether uh, this image is of a real bill or a fake bill. So we use the same network. And it's supposed to classify either plus one or class uh, plus positive class if it's real data and negative class if it's generated. So uh, how do we use this? Well, 
the principle is really simple, right? Once we, um, once we have such a machinery, so we, we have a generator that we are training, it produces a distribution over images, uh, we have a discriminator which is trained to separate between those generated images and, and real images, now we can just backprop into the whole thing to train the generator. And we can do that because uh, the generator is a neural net, so it's all differentiable. We're assuming here, and this is one of the limitations of GANs, uh, that the space uh, that we're generating into is continuous valued, and the discriminator is just another neural net. So we're just trying to uh, actually uh, change the generator so that the discriminator will be full, so that its output will be uh, closer to the output corresponding to uh, real data, so uh, positive class. And, um, and we, can, we can express that with a, a, a minimax problem, basically a game theory situation, which is quite interesting because it's completely different from the classical approaches in machine learning in which we have one objective function. Here we have two objective functions, uh, one for the generator and one for the discriminator. Um, so there's, there's a more uh, uh, abstract way to think about this. What GANs and all the families of GANs and related approaches are doing is thinking about uh, how to measure the discrepancy between distributions. This is what the Kale divergence does in a classical maximum likelihood framework, but now we're going to be using discriminators, so classifiers that are fairly easy to train, in order to tell us whether uh, two distributions are close to each other or not. And they're going to do it uh, by looking at a single instance at a time to try to figure out if it comes from this distribution or this distribution. All right. Um, so it turns out that the, the, the minimax objective for GANs is associated with uh, which is called the Jensen-Channon uh, Jensen divergence, which uh, is, is related to the KL divergence, but is different uh, and is uh, symmetric. Um, so again, there's been some uh, work by Nozen and others who have generalized this notion um, of a, a, a sort of divergence, which includes the KL divergence as a special case between two distributions, uh, and in which the, uh, the measure is obtained as an expectation over, think, uh, this Q theta is our generator, so these are things we can actually do averages over, of some uh, simple function of the ratio between the true data density and our model density. So we don't have P or Q theta, right? We don't have any explicit form uh, for neither the data distribution, of course, because this is what we're looking for, nor for our generator. This has to do with the fact that in the GAN, we have a machine to generate data, but we don't actually have a formula for uh, computing the density. So this is another departure from classical maximum likelihood. Um, and, uh, and then there are various ways of transforming this thing, which seems you know, not something we can compute, into things that can actually be computed like the, the GAN objective and, and many of its variants, in which typically there'll be uh, an expectation over a quantity that we can compute uh, uh, over the data set and a similar quantity over the generated uh, samples. And here F star is, uh, is just the convex conjugate of the function F, so it's, it's related in simple ways to the function F. Function F here is a simple function, and so is F star. And T is really our discriminator. So it's, it's the neural net that outputs a scalar which would like to be large for the uh, true data and to be small for the generated data, right? So we're just trying to change phi so that it's, it's, it's large on the training data and small on, on the generated data. And once we, uh, we have that, we can backprop into Q theta in order to, um, to change the, the uh, generator. OK. There's, there's, there's like tons of variations and papers on GAN, so I'm just going to focus on a few things. And one of them um, came from uh, 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 Arjovsky and collaborators 
who really had a really important insight uh, that's connected to my initial discussion about the limitations of, um, uh, of maximum likelihood and, and what GAN could help to avoid those, those limitations. And, um, and the idea is that a, a good way to measure the, 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 the similarity between two distributions that are concentrated, like the things we care about for images, um, is the earth mover's distance and, 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 and variation. So the idea of earth mover's distance is that uh, you're allowed to choose where probability mass from one distribution is going to go uh, for the other distribution. And you can you know, choose those displacements optimally and then pay the price for how much each, uh, each bit of probability mass is going to be uh, moving in space. And so the total distances that are traveled by all the little pieces of probability mass is the earth mover's distance. And it turns out that this is, again, a similar formula that I showed you before, except you have to constrain this discriminator in, in, in you know, the original setting of the WGAN. You have to um, constrain its uh, Lipschitz constant. But there's uh, other variations that exist now that are, uh, work better, but it basically one thing that comes out of this, and I won't, again, won't have time to go into detail, is you have to make sure the discriminator is not too powerful. Otherwise, you, you run into trouble. And this is something that actually has an impact practically. Um, there's a variation of GANs that um, uh, Devon Helm, that I mentioned initially, has developed in my group, um, in which, uh, which was initially meant to deal with the fact that uh, uh, GANs can only handle continuous spaces, and we'd like to extend to uh, discrete spaces. Um, so, so if we start with this kind of formula again, it turns out that there's a, a nice uh, relationship between uh, P and Q. Remember, we don't have neither of these guys, right? This is the true data density. This is our model density. But uh, uh, by playing with this equation, um, and in the case where the T is the optimal one that minimizes uh, this thing, or I guess maximizes this thing, uh, sorry, minimizes, uh, what we get is that the ratio between P and Q is given by a derivative that is very easy to compute. Uh, and so, so we now have this quantity, um, this derivative of the, the F, which comes here, um, which we call W, which we can estimate, which, which we can compute, and we can normalize it. And if we take uh, if we take this this ratio of normalized weights, we have a relationship between the, the the data density and the generated density, and we can use this in a sort of important sampling way to generalize GANs to uh, discrete spaces. Uh, in, in a form that's sort of reminiscent of uh, maybe reinforcement learning approaches where we're going to take the output density, conditional density, actually, of the, of the GAN, and uh, we're going to maximize the probability of the sample that was generated by the GAN, but weighted by these important sampling weights. And so now we can do this even if the X is discrete, um, and, and we get this, this B GAN, uh, which we call boundary seeking because the, the, that gradient becomes zero when um, the two densities are equal. So in other words, whereas in the original GANs, um, something funny happens, which I think is wrong, at least uh, em uh, empirically. In the original GAN, um, the, um, the generator continues getting a gradient when it's producing a sample that's going to be considered for sure to be a real example. Uh, in other words, it's trying to make the discriminator really, really as confident as possible that this is a, a real sample. Uh, even though we've passed the, the, the decision surface between real and imaginary and, and generated uh, a long time ago. And, and, and I think this creates unnecessary pressure and instability in the training, which goes away with the BGAN, because the BGAN will be happy as soon as you approach the boundary between um, generated and, and true data. And of course, then we can use this for discrete, uh, discrete data. Uh, these are examples of uh, sequences of characters that were generated.
by those, those BGANs, it's still not by far as good as um, autoregressive models like recurrent nets. Um, but uh, it's, it's a big progress. And of course, we can handle like discrete versions of images like MNIST and um, this is Celeb A faces. Um, and, uh, and we can, what's interesting also is that we can actually apply the same objective function in the case where the output is continuous. And again, we see the, the, the objective function for the generator because of the square here. This is the generator, this is the discriminator. Uh, it basically says, and this is, would be zero on the boundary, right? And plus one, minus one, depending on it, whether it thinks it's real or generated. So basically the square says, we're trying to just bring the output of the discriminator close to the boundary, which is zero and we're not trying to push it over the boundary. And, uh, and, and that's connected to recent work which um, uh, I did with um, uh, collaborators in France. Uh, but before I introduce that work, let me say a few words about an older paper which, was, which came out at about the same time as GANs. And, and in fact, we're using very similar idea uh, from Yaroslav Ganin, who's finishing his PhD with me. Uh, this is a 2015 ICML paper, uh, just basically six months after the NIPS uh, GAN paper. Um, and so his idea was we can do domain adaptation by training a neural net to output a representation which is going to have two properties. On one hand, representation is going to be the input of a classifier that does whatever job we are supposed to do in our main, our main task. And on the other hand, um, the, uh, the, this representation is going to have the property that it's invariant to some variables that we would like the system to be invariant to, like the domain here, because we want to do domain adaptation. Um, but this could be used for anything we'd like, any variable we'd like this representation to be insensitive to. So we train a classifier which outputs those variables, given the representation. And so these classifiers are trained as usual. Uh, this one we just backprop as normal into here. But this one, we do a, what's called gradient reversal. In other words, we're trying to make these guys make this classifier uh, produce the wrong answer. In other words, we change the sign of the gradient when it backprops here. So, so that was the 2015 paper, and it works, but it's numerically fairly uh, sensitive. And one thing that we discovered with uh, Clément Fetri and, and Pablo Piantanita is, so this is the same architecture, and we were trying to do something similar, is that you can, you can actually get rid of much of that instability by changing a little bit the objective function. So, in addition, so this part of the objective function says, you know, get this classification right. Uh, so we're optimizing the parameters here to get this right. And now this bit is supposed to say, get this wrong. But instead of saying, get it wrong, as much wrong as possible, we're saying, get it wrong, but not necessarily more than um, what a, a stupid model would do on this, which is the uniform or the marginal distribution. So, so here there's an absolute value, and it says the, the, the log likelihood that we're going to get on this should be as close as possible to the log likelihood of a stupid predictor, which is unconditional. Right? So in other words, we're not trying to go past the uh, error of a dumb predictor. And this is similar to the thing with the BGAN. We're just trying to bring to the boundary of what's... Uh, what, what, you know, what this guy would consider uh, the correct answer. And, um, and that, that basically uh, eliminates the uh, numerical problems that we've been having for a while with uh, this domain adaptation. Um, let me now uh, switch to something I find really exciting. This is going to be the last part of uh, my talk, uh, which shows how this idea of uh, training a classifier to distinguish between two distributions can be used to do things that we thought a few years ago very, very difficult and intractable. And, uh, and, and I think we're just seeing the tip of the uh, iceberg of how this could be used. Um, for example, to optimize independence between variables or, I mean, dependence or independence, obviously, depending if you want to minimize or maximize to minimize or maximize mutual information between variables, 
or to minimize or maximize entropy. All of these information theoretical quantities uh, can be related to uh, essentially comparing uh, two distributions, uh, the joint and the factorized marginal. As you know, uh, if A and B are independent, then one is equal to the other. And if they're not independent, then the ratio between those two uh, uh, probabilities essentially gives us mutual information. Um, and entropy is related to mutual information uh, in, in very trivial ways uh, as well. Um, so, so now we're going to basically use this idea. So this idea actually came from uh, my former postdoc, uh, Phil Brakel. And we had a paper this fall about this. So we can just train a classifier that's going to take uh, either a pair AB coming from the joint uh, of these two variables or a pair AB coming from the, the, the product of the marginals. How do we do that? So let's say that you had samples from the joint. Uh, you know, wh wherever they come from, and usually they'll come from some machinery that you'd like to optimize. You'd like to optimize these random variables so that maybe they are independent. This was the goal in this paper. So, so we have these samples from the joint, and now we can just very easily obtain samples from the two marginals by breaking the, the relationship, by taking uh, examples of A uh, you know, from, from uh, one pair with a B from another pair, and then that gives us samples from the factorized uh, marginal. So that's the idea, right? We're going to have, uh, for, in, in the paper was about nonlinear ICA, where we'd like uh, all of the units here to be independent. So it's not just A and B, it's A, A1, A2, A3, or whatever. Um, and we're going to have a classifier that's going to distinguish between two kinds of uh, vectors here. One which is just the original from the joint, the output of the neural net that takes the data and maps it to this new space. And another kind of sample in which we shuffle the variables. So how do we do that? Let's say we have a mini batch. In other words, say uh, take 100 samples from, from the output of this thing. And we just take each column, each variable, and we reorder randomly. So now each row contains uh, 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 you know, values of each of the variables that are unrelated to each other. But each of the marginal still is correct because we just reordered things. OK, so it's just, a, a, just a, a shuffle within the matrix here. And this guy has to decide whether its input comes from the shuffled, basically marginalized, or from the original joint. And then, of course, we do the same trick as in GANs. We backprop into this, in the case of ICA, independent component analysis. We're trying to get nonlinear components, so nonlinear functions of the input, which are independent. So we want to maximize independence, so we would like the score coming out when it, it's coming out of here to look like if it was coming out of here, right? So same trick as in GANs. Um, now, there's a more recent paper which goes one step further. So, so the, the other one was just to get independence, and it wasn't actually uh, computing information theoretical quantity. Um, this new paper actually produces an estimator of mutual information. Um, so this is called Mutual Information Neural Estimator. Mine, the first author, author is uh, uh, Balgazi. And uh, we're going to use the same kind of setup, uh, la, um, except that, uh, so, so, so it, in the implementations, we, did, we only have uh, two variables that we're trying to do mutual information over. Uh, so we have a machinery that produces A's, a machinery that produces B's. Uh, we can concatenate these two into one uh, thing. We can then, uh, again, produce as many batches of these, shuffle them to get the, the, the shuffled version, train a discriminator, all right? Uh, but we're going to train it in a, a particular way that's going to guarantee that the output of the discriminator, uh, in average, is actually going to give us uh, an estimator of the mutual information. Um, oh, um, I want to make you just a, a reminder that mutual information between two random variables A and B 
is related to entropy and conditional entropy through this formula. So you can see what mutual information really means. So to maximize mutual information between A and B, what you're trying to do is maximize the entropy of A and minimize the conditional entropy of B given A. So what is the conditional entropy of B given A? Well, suppose that B was a deterministic function of A. Then there's no uncertainty left in B given A, so that's zero, right? So in other words, the best that you can do here for maximizing mutual information is to keep as much information about whatever source of variation is producing A and make B as much predictable from A as possible. So, so mutual information is trying to make the two variables uh, as dependent on each other, so predictable from each other, but also contain information. Because otherwise, you could trivially get two variables that are, have high mutual information, I mean, high dependency if you, both of them are constant, for example. Then that would not be very interesting. So um, to obtain the mind objective, we go back to the same kinds of things I showed you before, this, this, uh, this formula for the mutual information, uh, and then use the same kind of tricks that I showed you that converts like the KL divergence, this is a KL divergence uh, between the joint and the factorized, right? So same kind of trick that I showed you before, and there are different bounds that can be obtained from this. Uh, we use this one, uh, in which we see that the mutual information is bounded by, um, on one hand, saying something like, oh, we, we want to maximize this discriminator output for the, when the samples come from the joint, and we want to, um, uh, minimize the log of the expected value of e to that thing when they come from the marginals. So it gives us actually a quantity that, that we can play with, and I'm not going to go into the technical details of how we do this, but uh, because there's like a little issue here with the log of an expected value, but we have ways to do this uh, fairly uh, efficiently and, and with a small variance estimator of the gradient of this thing. And, uh, and then on, on a particular data set, we can actually compute this quantity, and it's an estimator of the mutual information. We can actually check how close it is to the true mutual information in a case where we have a low dimensional uh, uh, data set. So this is like two dimensional data where we can compute the true mutual information, and we compare different estimators, and we find that, uh, well, in, in low dimension, pretty much all estimators do a good job. Uh, the problem with mutual information and why for many years people, or entropy is the same problem, people uh, really had trouble with is that in high dimension it becomes very hard to estimate. But, but our uh, estimator uh, seems to be uh, doing a pretty good job. So the dotted here is the true one and the blue one is, is the, the mine estimator. And, and the others are other estimators. Ah, so I, I gave you two bounds earlier, and, the, um, and one of them is tighter, and so uh, not surprisingly, the one with the tighter bound uh, is closer to the true mutual information. So they're just different variations on the objective function. And maybe one day somebody will find an even tighter bound. And the better you train your discriminator, the closer the, the, the bound is going to be, basically. So we tested this on trying to improve GANs, so it's kind of GANs helping GANs. Um, one of the problems with GANs, as you may have heard about, uh, that I didn't mention, is that um, the, the, the price you pay for um, missing modes in the distribution is very small, right? So, so the, 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 the GAN training objective is quite happy to put probability mass in places where um, there is data, and, and, but also, like, put zero probability in places where there is data. And remember, it, it's close to this idea that we're paying a price, but uh, not such a huge price for missing some of the data points. Um, so, so what we're doing here is we're adding a regularizer to GANs that says that the, the, um, the, the relationship between the latent variable and the generated variable should be that they should have as much mutual information as possible. Because if we do that, then we're trying to cover the space as much as possible. And so, uh, so, so you end up with, with estimators like this. So the blue is the real data, and the yellow is, is the generated. Uh, again, these are toy things for now. But you know, this, again, a bunch of a mixture of Gaussians in 2D. The GAN will capture some of the components. It will miss others. You add this regularizer. It gets all the components. Uh, we played another game to verify this. 
So we created a version of MNIST that has, um, I think, uh, four or five digits superimposed with different colors. And so now we know how many modes there are. There's a thousand modes, right? Um, uh, sorry, uh, three digits. Yeah, so t 10 to the three. Uh, there, there's a, there's, uh, there's a, a thousand modes corresponding to, you know, what is the identity of the first digit, the identity of the second digit, the identity of the third digit. So, so the modes are pretty obvious, and, and we can count pretty easily by looking at each color uh, whether a mode has been uh, uh, generated, right? So it's a trick to, 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 mer to verify that the generator has captured all the modes. So there's a thousand modes in this, in this distribution. And the question is uh, whether a generator will actually put probability mass on all the modes. We can just count how many have been visited. Uh, so regular GANs yeah, get 99 out of 1,000. ALI is a variation that we worked on a few years ago. Get 16, uh, various types of GANs. And uh, the GAN with mine is, is basically getting all of them. OK, actually, um, that's it. I'm going to stop here. This, uh, I mean, the, the GAN world is, is pretty amazing. And there's a lot of work going on. I, I can't track everything. Uh, there's a lot of excitement in this area. But I think we're just unearthing tools that are, go beyond the in, initial goal of modeling distributions and, and can be used in many, many areas where we're dealing with information theoretical quantities. Uh, not just for generation or conditional generation, which were the or original goals, but, but comparing distributions uh, to measure things like mutual information, uh, entropy, uh, statistical dependence, and things like this. Thank you very much. I have uh, a couple of questions. Um, the first is probably the easier one, um, which is that, as I understand it, quite a number of years ago, a researcher by the name of Doug Lanat at Stanford, you know, tried the extreme uh, thing of sort of putting in real world knowledge, right. and uh, apparently it didn't get very far. And I'm just trying to figure out what the what the issue was. And uh, what the issue, well, the issue with, uh, To a form of form. Might not be easily uh, writable in a compact form. And second, a lot of our knowledge is probabilistic. It isn't something, well, it's part of the question that it's hard to put it in rules and facts, right? So. Uh, there's second question is uh, more of a mathematical one, which is the fact that, you know, what, from what little I know about all this stuff, uh, essentially what you're doing is you're sort of trying to uh, find a minimum in some very, very high dimensional space. And there are lots of uh, local minima. And the question is, well, uh, uh, some related questions. Do people have a handle on how much of the problem with yes. is uh, because of that issue? more dimensions, the easier it is, in the sense that the local minima will tend to be close to the global minimum. They will be easy. They will be good. And you don't get trapped in bad local minima. And there's both theory behind this and experiments to validate this hypothesis. Thank you. 
excellent talk. So I have a question about using domain adversary training. Um, so uh, we have seen using domain adversary training, uh, but that's more often for the continuous valued signals like speech or images. So uh, do you think? Uh, it is fundamentally flawed if we apply the domain adversary training for the domain adaptation of discrete signals. Thank you. Right. Oh. Uh, the one we seek again, the big N, uh, was meant to address that, and we've made some progress, and there are other papers that uh, are making progress in this direction. But I think it's still an open question. I think we will find solutions to this. And you know, people are very creative. So uh, I'm, I'm very confident. There is a lot of work in general in, in machine learning in trying to uh, do credit assignment through stochastic discrete decisions. This is a very common issue. It comes up in reinforcement learning when your actions are discrete and stochastic. It comes up in, in discrete GANs. Uh, it comes up in all kinds of scenarios where you'd like to optimize over decisions that are discrete, and they have to be discrete. So there's, there's a rich literature already, and I think it's going to continue, and I think we're going to make progress on this. So I just want to thank you very much from the uh, uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering Department and uh, for the Tandon School of Engineering for coming here and giving this talk. We're very grateful to have you here. And also we're grateful to Anna for organizing this. So I think your next meeting is with Ramesh, which is, I think, across my uh, my office. All right. I don't know already, Matt. So this is uh, Shiv Panvar. Uh, this is Ivan Savasnik. Ivan is uh, current Hi. chair of the department. Nice to meet you. And she, uh, she was helping me with the developing the very idea of the, of, uh, of the seminar series. Great. And it's a great idea. Yeah, I think so. There's, there's obviously yeah. a big, a big uh, demand for this. Yeah, I heard you were really busy. And Thanks for coming. My schedule is really crazy. Yeah. yeah. So we're gonna have uh, also. Yeah. So Jan was here. Uh, yeah.